Hello again from the Posh Lavish Digs of Mill City Roasters. I'm Steve Green. I'm responsible for everything and mine are the official views of Mill City Roasters. Over the last several years, we've had the opportunity to speak with thousands of people about their commercial roasting operations. Whether pure startups or established companies researching options for expansion, we've heard or detected a handful of the same questions from nearly every person we've spoken with. Questions like, what's the best coffee roaster? That's a tough question for several reasons. Obviously, machines differ in design and construction. And each company states its value proposition is offering the ultimate in something. This can be confusing at best and at worst a little misleading. Coffee roasters have been around for an awfully long time and as relatively simple pieces of equipment operating at relatively low RPMs and relatively low temperatures on a Kelvin scale anyway, they tend to hang around for a long time. Consider for a moment the idea that as Grandpa Green used to say, most things fix themselves or people get used to them. And not surprisingly, the informed opinion of most people is shaped by their experience relative to their abilities, palates, and businesses, but typically on a surprisingly limited number of machines. Coaxing a pretty good coffee out of a less than perfect machine speaks far more to the skill of the operator than the quality of the equipment. Coffee quality is a spectrum and a moving target. Irrespective of the machinery, the three big predictors of coffee quality are the quality of the greens, the skill of the operator, and competent extraction. Remove any one of those three and your quality stool falls over. And in light of that analogy, I'm occasionally surprised when people call me to get a sample of coffee roasted on our machine. What purpose could that serve? How do they know the quality of the green, the quality of the roast? How does that apply to their business? How do I know their water quality or grind size, brewing method or water temperature? The very question illustrates a fundamental misunderstanding of coffee that is not infrequently preyed upon by people that want to win arguments or sell roasters. Since the 1920s, marketing, sales, internet trolls, and other professional propagandists have been studying something their secret society refers to as the FUD principle. That would be fear, uncertainty, and doubt. Typically masquerading as common sense, which for our purpose today you should probably think of as opinion unencumbered by the thought process. The idea here is to manipulate your fears, thus stampeding you into a safe point of view or purchasing decision. Here's a few examples you'll run into as you shop for commercial coffee roasters. Toxic combustion gas. Contaminating your roast or roasting your lungs? Check the stack, do the math. The amount of combustion gas relative to the amount of dilutive airflow is minuscule. Moreover, the combustion efficiency and gas usage of most roasters is so low you could probably literally breathe the exhaust. Now, use your head here. People have been scrambling eggs, frying bacon, baking biscuits simultaneously on gas stoves forever in unvented kitchens. Has this ever polluted your Sunday brunch experience? Probably not. Imported roasters and the loss of American jobs. This is hysterical. One large manufacturer likes to talk smack about imported machines when they imported all of their gas parts for decades and only ceased when that manufacturer quit making parts that small. My company builds in China, but we have a full staff in Minneapolis and a full-time minimum wage of $15 an hour with medical, dental, and vision care. We've also helped launch more than 1,500 small businesses over the last few years, currently employing somewhere around 3,000 people. So spare me, please. And as long as I'm shouting from the top of this particular soapbox, We've got 40 workers at the factory in Shenzhen, most of whom are related, by the way, sending money home to support their children and parents and family farms. They work a five-day week in a clean, well-lit, safe facility. They live above the factory, are provided meals and medical care, and transport home to visit their family several times per year. They like their jobs, and they're proud of their work. 
Now in coffee, we celebrate the idea of supporting impoverished producers with policy like fair trade. Good idea. But to some people, my guys aren't the right color to qualify. I have nothing but contempt for those people. Stainless steel or atmospheric burner hot spots. One of my personal favorites because they make hot spots sound like the coffee equivalent of the bubonic plague. I heard this repeated so many times at my first SCA show that fear and doubt and curiosity compelled me to rush back to the shop to cut 12 inch square plates of 430 stainless, 304 stainless, and 1018 carbon steel, put them over a burner, and then use the experiment as an excuse to purchase the brand new state of the art super cool little infrared video camera I'd been itching to get my hands on for the past year. Turns out the 304 plate was all of about 10 degrees higher than the 1018. The 430 was less than a five degree difference. Here's the takeaway. Turn your burners down, decrease your preheat temp, or possibly just maybe rotate your drum. Oh, you were doing all that anyway. Great, no worries then. Now the heart of that roaster may be a rotating drum, but the quality of heat transfer is an amalgamation of factors including material selection, iron, stainless, cast, copper, ceramic, whatever, single or double wall thickness and separation, drum speed, burner type, position and diffusion, airflow, and effective mixing veins. And whether you know it or not, the temperature in your drum varies according to height. A good drum moves every single bean through every single portion of the drum continuously throughout the duration of the roast. If you've got even roasts, you have a good drum. If you do not have even roasts, you either have poorly sorted and sized green coffee, your drum speed too low, or your preheat temp too high for the batch size. Only after you've exhausted these issues can you conclude you have an actual drum problem. Parts, service, support, and training. Now this is interesting because most of the people that build roasters fall into two categories. The first build solid machines, but they don't really understand coffee the way that you and I do. They don't buy greens, they don't cup, and they don't understand how their customers actually use the equipment to produce better specialty coffee. The second group roast a bit and end up distributing machines. The majority of distributors are middlemen. They don't really understand machinery and are not infrequently unable to support it. Now that's not a big deal for a hobbyist but potentially a big problem if you are relying on your roaster as production equipment. For the record, that's not FUD, that's fact. My company started out as the North American distributor for North Coffee in China. We later partnered with the Taiwanese owner, JYR. We're in charge of sales, service, support, warranty, and training worldwide. JYR covers China and Taiwan. We handle the rest. I've worked in engineering and manufacturing for over 30 years and run about 75% of our total R&D myself here in Minneapolis. We build a nice roaster. We inventory warranty parts here in the U.S. We've got a fully equipped machine shop and fabrication facility here and we have yet to lose a patient. Of the handful of roaster manufacturers that actually offer training we're slightly unique in that we tend to teach coffee more than machinery. We think operating the roaster is easy and we can teach you to run the machinery in about a half an hour. But coffee is hard. Plan on spending a bunch of time honing your craft. Our intent for the classes is to help aspiring commercial roasters learn to roast quality craft coffee as quickly as possible with a focus on the factors that drive commercial success afterburners. This is a great scare tactic where your salesman suggests that your entire operation is but one irate phone call away from being shut down unless you invest in the insurance of an afterburner. Although a terrific way to double your lease payment, afterburners are not required for the vast majority of installations. And this is especially true for specialty coffee producers as finish temps are generally lower and produce much less smoke and scent than oily dark roasted commodity coffee. In the areas they are required, afterburners are easily sourced. In densely populated mixed-use locations where scent abatement is a necessity, we've developed cost-effective protocols and equipment to minimize scent. 
efficiency. Although there's much talk about efficiency, it centers around two areas. The first is the whole combustion gas polluting the roast nonsense we've already covered. The second revolves around burner design or heating modality. Infrared burners, for instance, are said to be more efficient than direct flame atmospheric burners. And on a graph, this is undeniably true. But you aren't roasting on a graph. Other factors come into play, like thermal mass. Thermal mass means that a heavier constructed roaster acts like a thermal battery absorbing heat energy and releasing it over time to create a highly predictable roasting environment. Our machines are welded solid with double walled and insulated chassis and welded double walled drums. A more efficient infrared burner based system might work great, but typically at a full batch size that burner is run at 100% for most of the roast. Now we typically run 100% for only the first few minutes and reduce the gas input dramatically throughout the duration of the roast. Now, which is more efficient? I have no idea because I don't know your batch size or roast level. I do know that thanks to horizontal drilling and fracking, gas is dirt cheap. Your gas expense is literally pennies per pound of roasted coffee. On machines with integrated afterburner recirculating heat systems, if an afterburner is required, there may be some marginal efficiency gain. The problem is those machines are both spectacularly engineered and spectacularly expensive. Commercial roasting is a business, and the business decision is one where the additional purchase expense must be balanced against the marginal gain in efficiency. In other words, does saving $50,000 in gas over a 10-year span justify spending an additional $75,000 today? Probably not. Automation. This is where one where people who are insecure about their knowledge of coffee roasting are told that automation prevents them from making mistakes and assures coffee quality. Take a pass, take the class. Education is more powerful than automation. Without understanding coffee, all automation will do is allow you to more efficiently produce bad coffee. There's another idea that an automated machine is a good idea because it can eliminate an operator or improve consistency. Now, perhaps in some cases, but automation is at best a blunt instrument. Roasting is a sensory driven process. Data logging, graphs, measurements, readings are all meaningless without the context of sensory cues. If you aspire to quality, automation simply isn't capable of the same level of exactitude as a trained and diligent operator. Now to be sure, sometimes quality takes a backseat to price and it just doesn't matter as much. But personally, I think that if automation is desired for efficiency, the better choice is simply a bigger roaster. Your job as a roaster is to game the physics of whatever you're roasting on to coax the best possible balance of sweetness, body, and acidity out of that particular mass of seed. Some machines, like mine, have characteristics that make that job easier. Thermal mass, more precise control, higher BTU to bean mass ratio, etc. We care about roast quality, and we've done the best we know to put better machinery within reach of people aspiring to the adventure of craft roasting. Diedrich, Probat, Loring, Giesen, USRC, Sanfran, etc. all build solid equipment, and each machine has its quirks, but as Grandpa Green mentioned, you'll probably get used to it. We all make pretty good machinery, and we all do a pretty good job supporting our customers, but we really only provide the tool Ultimately, the best roaster is you. I'm Steve Green from Mill City Roasters. Thank you and good night.